Well, good morning, Crossroads Church. It is good to be here at the North Glen campus. I want to welcome those of you joining us at Fort Lupton, Thornton, online, wherever you may be, as we continue in our worship together by opening uh, God's Word, as we continue in this series where we're taking the slow walk through uh, the Gospel of Luke. If you are new with us and I haven't had the privilege of meeting you, my name is Matt Manning. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads Church, and we have been on this journey uh, really kind of through the Gospel of Luke. And if you've been with us over, these, over the course of this series, We've seen that Luke's gospel is really this eyewitness account, this eyewitness investigation, really concerning the truth claims all about Jesus. That Luke is writing this account uh, to a man named Theophilus. And what we've come to learn over the last several weeks is that Theophilus is a man of high standing. He's a man of uh, a cultural elite. He's a political figure in Roman culture. And he's come across the things of Jesus. He's kind of come in contact with the things of Jesus. He's seen Jesus' followers. He's been taught some things about Jesus. And he's at this point in his life where he's trying to make a decision of whether to follow Jesus or not. And this renowned historian named Luke sits down and he begins to write the story of Jesus to Theophilus. And he says to him these things. He says, Theophilus, I write these things to you so that you might have certainty concerning the things that you've been taught about Jesus. And as we've gone through this series now for six weeks, and as we've peered into this letter some 2,000 years later, Luke's goal is still the same for us today. Luke's goal is still the same. This is point number one in your outline, that the goal of Luke is that you and I would have certainty, this unshakable, immovable, mountain-like certainty concerning the things that we have been taught about Jesus. See, Luke wants us to read this gospel with such intent that when we close this book today, when we close our Bibles today, that we would say, yes, this is our hope. This is our certainty. This is our peace. This is our salvation. And that's been my prayer throughout this whole series, is that as we've gone through the beginning kind of two chapters of this book, that as we've seen the angelic encounters, as we have seen this old priest and his wife give birth to this special boy named John, as we've been introduced to this beautiful young woman named Mary and her faithfulness, giving birth to an even more special boy named Jesus, that my prayer every week has been that as we get done, that we would have the immovable, rock-solid certainty of the things that we've been taught about Jesus. And so last week... It was only fitting that it snowed, that we got the first snow as the season, as Pastor Chris shared with us the Christmas story out of Luke chapter 2, and as we looked at the birth of, of Jesus. It's an account that we're so familiar with, isn't it? And yet, every time we read it, it's a captivating story, isn't it? It's just one of those captivating stories from the hardships of, of Mary and Joseph and her travels as, as she's pregnant, nine months pregnant, traveling 80 miles by donkey, because of a king's untimely decree to count people, to Jesus being born in the back alley of a holiday inn, to angels showing up, to shepherds coming and bowing before this baby, singing praises to God. And as all of this is unfolding and there's all, all around this, this moment of Jesus' birth, we have Mary, this beautiful picture of Mary, just kind of sitting in the background, taking it all in as the mother of this child. And Luke tells us that she treasured it all. She treasured it all. Such a beautiful story, the Christmas story. Well, this week, as we get into it, we're going to look at the next story in Luke's gospel. The story of when Joseph and Mary take Jesus, baby Jesus, to the temple to be dedicated. Now, of all four of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's only Luke. Luke is the only gospel that records a few things from Jesus' childhood. The only reason that we know anything about Jesus' childhood is because of Luke. And as we dive into the story today, it makes sense, doesn't it? Because Luke remembers doing this eyewitness account. He's, he's going to eyewitnesses this story. He's interviewing them. And most likely he interviewed Mary, all of the detail of Jesus' birth, all of the things that happened. He's interviewing Mary. And like any mom, she's doting on her child. She's sharing those moments of childhood that made her smile. Those moments when she realized that God's promise was being fulfilled in this little child that was growing up. She shares these stories time and time again. And of all the stories that she shared with Luke, Luke decides to include two of them in his gospel for us. The first one we're going to look at this week, and then next week we'll look at the second one. And so if you have your Bibles, I would love for you to go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 22. It's where we're going to be today, looking at verses 22 really through kind of 38 together. 
And in Luke's gospel, we're going to read, like I said, about Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. Now, just so that you know, just so that you know, as we get into this story, there's a little bit of crazy in this story, all right? And so what we're going to do is we're just going to walk through it together. And then I have a few things that I'm going to say about it at the very end, all right? So Luke chapter 2, verse 22. And when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, in those days, in those days, it was Jewish custom, custom, about 40 days after the birth of a child, mom, dad, and child would make their way to Jerusalem to visit the temple in order to have their firstborn son dedicated and to finish the purification of the mother. Those were the two things, that every family, every family in Israel would be expected to make this journey to Jerusalem to go to the temple for these two things. Now, the first thing, the dedication of the child, that's something in our culture that we still get today, isn't it? It's something we do as a church. It's something that we see all the time. We kind of get dedicating children to the Lord. But the second thing that they go to the temple for, this purification of the mother, this is something a little bit foreign to us. We don't see this a lot. We don't, we don't get to, to witness this. It's not something that we practice in our faith. And so it's a little bit foreign to us in our culture. And so here's what's going on here. That when a mom, when a mother had gave birth to a child, according to the law of Moses, think Old Testament, all right? Think, think book of Leviticus specifically. That when a mom gave birth to a child, that bloody event right? If you've ever been in that pregnancy room, you know, a bloody event. That bloody event made the mother unclean. And being an unclean person was a big deal in this culture during this time, because if you were unclean, it meant that you could not engage in corporate worship. You could not go to the synagogues and worship. You could not go to the temple and worship. That to be unclean meant that you could not participate in corporate worship. And so what would happen is about 40 days after the birth, mom and baby would, and dad would make their way to the temple in order to participate in this, in this ritualistic cleansing, this, this cleaning that would happen where sacrifices were offered so that they would be known or be now clean before God. Now, fascinating about this story is that as Luke shares the, the story of Jesus, time and time again, he puts in these little nuggets, very Very little did Mary and Joseph know that this ritualistic act that they're going through, this this offering of sacrifices in order to be clean before God, was a foreshadow of 1,500 years in the making, 1,500 years in the making of what their baby boy would do some 30 years into the future on the cross. Fascinating, isn't it? If you want more information about being unclean and clean, you can check out the book of Leviticus, specifically 10, 11, and 12. But it was a big, big deal. Now, as the final act, as we read in Leviticus, of purification, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons would be offered as a sacrifice. Now, hear this. In these days, this sacrifice was not the sacrifice that it was expected. It was the sacrifice that was permitted under the law of Moses as a poor clause, as an exception clause for the poor. It wasn't the sacrifice that was accepted or expected. It was the sacrifice that was permitted for poor people. See, Jesus was a poor boy. Jesus' family was not wealthy. The Jesus' family was not elite. They were from nowhere Israel. His parents were just peasants trying to make a way in this world. Jesus and mother and father, Mary and Joseph, while they were very devout to God, we see that here in this passage, while they were devout to their faith, they could not afford the typical sacrifice given in terms of purifying the mother for her to be clean before God. That Jesus was poor, and he knew what it was like to grow up in a poor family. And as we read through the gospel of Luke, time and time again, we see in his ministry where he is for the poor, where he would come alongside and feed the poor, where he would care for the poor, where he would encourage the poor, where he'd give the poor promises of God's generosity in the kingdom to come, that Jesus was for the poor. 
Now, all of this story is pretty interesting up to this point, but now here comes the crazy verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, admittedly, if we were reading this for the first time, and we didn't know anything else about this story, the picture that we get here of Simeon is a little bit odd. The picture here we see is that of a guy who is a little bit crazy. Because he's running around telling people that he's not going to die before the Messiah comes back. That the Messiah is going to come before he goes to the grave. And just by the way, there had been no prophets in Israel for 400 years. That even people who believed in the Messiah, it was more of a wish than it was a hope at this point. That nobody, nobody would have believed him in this moment. And he's not even a prophet. He's just a guy, just a dude running around saying, the Messiah's coming before I die. Verse 27. And he came into the spirit, into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child of Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. All right, here's what's happening. Mary and Joseph bring Jesus on child dedication Sunday. And as they're bringing the child up to the priest to have him dedicated, Simeon snatches Jesus up, spins around and says, now I can die, now I can die. All right? That's what's going on here. Now, look, if that happened today, if you walked into this place filled with the Holy Spirit in that way, we got security, we taser you, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the way this goes down. Verse 30, verse 30, for my eyes, he says, has seen your salvation, that you've prepared in the presence for all people, light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled. That's Mary and Joseph. They marveled at what was being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher, she was advanced in your years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. So after this encounter with Simeon, we're introduced to this old woman named Anna. And Anna was 84 years old. Now, in those days, most women got married around the age of 17. And what we're told is that she lived with her husband seven years before he died. And then she became a widow for the next 60 years. Now, let me tell you, in this culture, being a widow that young and not remarrying would have been considered weird. That Anna would have been, would have been odd. That she's, and at 84 years old... She decides that she's just going to set up shop in the temple and never leave. That she's just going to hang out there all of her days. Verse 38. And coming up at the very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. In other words, while Simeon's spinning around with the baby saying, now I can die, Anna gets up and starts preaching. That's a crazy child dedication Sunday, all right? That's what's happening in this story. And if you've been a part of this series from the very beginning, it's kind of par for the course, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of par for the course as we've walked through Luke together. you got this guy who's filled with the Holy Spirit going, I'm not going to die until the Messiah comes back. And the Messiah had been prophesied for thousands of years. Thousands of years the Messiah had been prophesied. In our modern day culture, this would, the only thing that we could even maybe get close to it's like if there was a guy on 16th Street Mall with a sign that said, Jesus is coming back tomorrow. And as people walk by on the 16th Street Mall, they would just look at him and just shake his head. Like, like, like you're unbelievable. You're, you've lost your mind. You're, you're crazy. And at this baby dedication, he snatches up one of the babies and he holds him up and he says, now I can die. Now I can die. And as soon as that's over, this poor woman who's never really gotten over her husband 
who's like hanging out at the temple, the woman who nobody knows what to do with, gets up and starts preaching and says, it's here, it's happened, he's here, it's done. Now remember, (laughs) Mary is recounting all of this for Luke years later. Like Mary's sharing all of this story with Luke. In all of the crazy things, of all of the crazy things in this story, maybe the most crazy thing of all is this, is that the priests, the professionals, the educated, the religious leaders, the pastors of the day, who at this dedication saw Jesus as nothing more than another baby boy to be dedicated. See, it's Anna and Simeon who hear the whispers of the Holy Spirit. It's Anna and Simeon who hear and see salvation. It's a profound moment in scripture. Now listen, this is the 10th time that the Holy Spirit has shown up in two chapters in Luke's gospel. That not only is Luke sharing with Theophilus the account of Jesus' life so that he would have certainty but he's also tracing through human history the movement of the Spirit. That time and time again, Luke is continually reminding us of the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers, in the lives of God's people as a normative experience in things that we would consider normal and even in the things that we would consider a little bit crazy. And I'm gonna go out on a little bit of a scary limb for some of you because I don't know what you believe about God speaking today. But I believe that God still speaks to us today. That God speaks to us in his word, and God also speaks to us outside of his word. Now when he speaks outside of his word, never is it in contrary to scripture, but he definitely speaks outside of the scriptures. And I know for some of you that might be a little bit uncomfortable for you, but I've experienced it. Half of my friends in Lebanon have come to Jesus because Jesus showed up to them in a dream. Muslim people who had very little knowledge of who Jesus is shows up in a dream of theirs and says, follow me, and the next morning they wake up and they give their lives to Jesus. What do we do with that? What do you do with that in your Western American Christian mind? How do you, how do you, how do you make sense of that? God speaks, the Bible says that God speaks to us. That he speaks to us through creation and through nature. He speaks through us to, through dreams and visions and in prayer and in seeking the Lord and through wisdom and impressions and intuition. That the Spirit of God speaks to our hearts and to the depths of our souls. And as he speaks, we filter them through the word of God. We always filter them through the word of God. And then we take that step of faith. And come on, sometimes we mess it up, don't we? Sometimes we hear wrong. But God speaks. And maybe in your life today, God's whispering to you. Maybe the Holy Spirit is is speaking to your heart today, to to the depths of your soul today. So you've got a God who shows up and speaks. And he shows up and he speaks to this to this man and woman who everybody thought was a little bit crazy, and they were kind of odd. But as this gospel unfolds for us, we come to realize that they were the ones seen most clearly in this moment. That God is actively speaking, and oh, how I long, how I long to see the Spirit of God unleashed in my life and in this church the way that I see the Spirit of God unleashed in the world in which Luke lives. I long for that in my soul. The Holy Spirit was confirming to the depths of Simeon and Anna's soul that everything was coming together, that in this moment, this strategic moment, all of God's provinces and all of God's sovereignty and all of his rule were coming together in this moment for something significant to happen. And as Mary and Joseph bring baby Jesus up to the altar, Simeon steps in and he picks up this kid and he says, now I can depart Now I'm released, that's what the word means. I'm released, I can die in peace. Because I have seen what? I've seen salvation, he says. This baby boy that I hold in my hands, this is my salvation. A light, 
of revelation to the Gentiles, to all of the nations, the glory of Israel. In other words, this is the Messiah, this is the Savior, this is the fulcrum of which all of history hinges on. And what Simeon's saying in this moment is he's declaring through the Holy Spirit, this point number two in your outline, that the beneficiaries of God's grace, of God's mercy, of God's salvation, is not just the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. And let me tell you, this is huge for us, that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah who came as the glory of Israel, as he shows mercy to Israel, that mercy is so great that it overflows the banks of Israel and brings light of revelation to all people. A light of revelation that shows this is the true God and the true way to salvation. A light that would shine on every person's soul. And Simeon says, I have seen salvation now. I can depart. I can be released. I can die in peace. So here's my question for you. Can you say that? Do you say that in your life? that I've seen salvation, I can now die in peace. Because here's my experience, we don't often echo those words very often together, do we? Because as a whole, as a whole, we're pretty afraid of death. We have this terrible tenacity of holding on to this, to this world. And even those of us who say we're ready to see Jesus at any moment, most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time, that's just bravado speaking, isn't it? I mean, I can tell you, I've never been on an airplane where we've been going through bad turbulence where someone rises up and goes, yes, we're going to go see Jesus. No, we're all white knuckling it, right? Going, Jesus, you get me out of here, I will never miss church again. <laughs> that's the way it goes. See, I believe that the fears around death and dying all come back to the same issue, that in the end, we need the faith that Simeon and Anna had in order to believe. To believe that Jesus is the one who the Holy Spirit said he was, and that he came and did according to what he was going to do, and he accomplished what the Holy Spirit said he was going to accomplish. See, for a lot of us, when it comes to death, we think that when we die, that somehow all of the secrets that we have are gonna be exposed. That all of the secrets that we have, when we die, all of them come to light. Like when you die in that moment, you're going to stand before God in his throne room. And all of your secrets will be on display. And for the first time ever, God will see you as you actually are. Come on. In that moment when you die, and you're standing before the throne room of God, it's not going to be like God's going to be going, what? Matt, you're a pastor. I didn't know you had that in your soul. Let me rethink this. See, the mistake that we make over and over again is thinking that God doesn't already know our secrets. He already knows all of our secrets. He already, he already knows all of that. This is the essence of the gospel. That those secrets, those thoughts, the actions, the doubts, the fears, the things that you did so long ago that still haunt your soul and bring shame, the things that, that bring strife to your heart, those things that you did 20 years ago or 10 years ago or last night, he already knows all of that. And yet we pretend and we hide, don't we? We pretend like this, this is like a big game of hide and go seek. And I'm just gonna keep hiding from those who are closest from me and I'm gonna hide from God. And if we're honest with ourselves, it's exhausting, isn't it? It's just exhausting playing this hide-and-go-seek every day. And yet we do it, and we believe that if we just like put on this cloak of righteousness, if we just put on the cloak of church attendance, if we just put on the cloak that everything's all good in my life, that no one will be the wiser. And so we put on these cloaks, and we play our part, and the whole time we're pretending that God does not know when the reality is, is that he sees and knows it all. And I'm telling you, the person who understands that God knows all of our shortcomings, that he knows all of our failures, that he knows all of our secrets, all of our sins, even those emotions and fears that we refuse to share with anyone else in this world, he already knows those things and he is still 
there. That's the person who gets to walk in peace. And when there's no secrets between you and God and you and man, then this is when his salvation becomes real. This is when life takes another level because we have a real chance, a real, real chance at community, a real chance at at real intimacy. And upon death, we know that we've got no secrets with God and he's loved us through this life. There's no way that he's going to abandon us in death. Come on, hear me on this. We've got to have the Simeon and Anna-like faith in order to believe that. Listen, if Simeon's right, and Jesus is the glory of Israel, which means that he is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament, which means he's the fulfillment of the law, that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, that he's the fulfillment of of all the Old Testament prophecies, then that means that he is the Messiah, the Savior, the light of revelation to all of the world. And if that is true, then that means the ransom for your sin has been paid and the quarrel with God is over. There is no more hide and seek between you and God. And our boy Simeon sees this. And he goes, peace I live and with peace I sleep and now with peace I can die. And he finally, finally, finally gets to feel all of those emotions that oftentimes we don't get to feel because we are banging our heads against the ceiling of our shame. And he gets to worship in the fullness of his spirit, face to face with his king. And his soul cries out, I see salvation. I see your salvation. My soul is now at rest. There's peace. O Theophilus, I write to you these things so that you might have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught about Jesus. This is your gospel. This is your hope. This is your salvation. This is your peace. May we have the faith of Simeon and Anna. May we be so attuned to God that we hear the whispers of the Holy Spirit the way they heard the whispers of the Holy Spirit. And may we risk being a little crazy for God like they risked being a little crazy for God. And may in the end of all of that, may our souls be at peace because of the salvation that we have, because of this little baby boy, born of this special girl, to come and be the light of revelation to all of the world. Will you pray with me, Father? We ask that you would make this real to us. Lord, that the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, would be alive in our souls and in our hearts and in our being. Lord, that we would hear the whispers as you you speak to us, risking being a little bit crazy for you. Lord, every single one of us wants the peace that Simeon had in our lives. God, would you grant it to us today? Would you give it to us? And as we keep praying with heads bowed, eyes closed at all of our campuses, at all of our different campuses, I know for some of you, you're you're recognizing that the Holy Spirit is nudging you right now. You've been craving, looking for salvation, looking for for peace in your life, and you've looked for it your entire life, and you have not been able to find it. And the reason that you have not been able to find it is because there is a real void in your heart, a spiritual need to be right with God. And yet our problem is, is that we've sinned, that every single one of us has has fallen short of the standard and created a break in our relationship with God. And it creates this longing in our souls for something more. And our spirits are restless until we find that, until our relationship with God is restored. And so for most of us, we, we try to work our way back to God, leaving Jesus out of the picture. But it's Jesus, the sinless son of God, perfect in every way, who died on our place on that cross 
raised him three days later so that we could have life. Any one of us could have life. Listen, it doesn't matter how dark your life is, how long you've been running or what you've done. Jesus died in your place on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins so you do not have to play hide and go seek anymore. God raised him to life so that you could have life. So that your sins would be forgiven and the emptiness would be gone. And the promise from the scriptures is that if anyone calls upon the name of God, anyone calls on the name of Jesus, then their sins would be forgiven and the emptiness would be gone. Their need would be met. Relationship with God restored. The old is gone and the new has come. You're a new creation. And at all of our campuses today, there are people, I know there are people who are searching. Your search is over. Turn from your sin and run towards Jesus. Call on his name and he will hear your prayers and he will forgive your sins and he will make you new. That's why you're here today. That, that's why you're here. You know it. That's why you're here. Your search is over. The spirit is speaking to you. And so at all of our campuses, those of you who the, who the Spirit is, is prompting in your soul right now, say yes to Jesus. With your lips right now, just say, I give my life to you, Jesus. I give my life to you, Jesus. That's your prayer. For all of those of you who prayed that prayer, praise God, you are now a part of the family. And would all of Crossroads, just with your hands, clap for those who prayed that prayer today. Would you clap with me today? God, we give you all the glory and all of the praise. God, we come here today to bring worship to you. This is all for you. Jesus, we pray peace on all of us that you would save us. It's in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. amen. All right, thanks, Pastor Matt. Oh, well, friends, if you responded in any 